Start now boarding all passengers to the basis.net. Woo! We made it! Hey, how's everyone doing? Sorry, I'm doing a uh, speed test right now. It looked like I was getting a glitch there in the beginning. So I just want to make sure that uh, everything's coming through. Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Sup, my funksters. I like that, Russell. That's good. We got, actually, I, I wonder what the majority of you bass players tuning in today. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get the extra slack in my headphone cable. I'm wondering what kind of music you guys play. Do me a favor. Um, as you're coming in, tell me your name. Tell me where you're from. But also tell me like what your normal gig is back when you had a gig <laughs> or if you had a gig or even just, you know, what kind of, uh, sorry, what kind of stuff you like to play. Uh, and the reason I ask is Russell said, Hey, what's up funksters. And I don't know, maybe not everyone plays funk music. Maybe I got some metal heads in here. Um, some rockers, hip hop. I don't know. So tell me guys, I'm, I'm really, really interested. What kind of music do you guys play? I don't know if I can tell you what I do. <laughs> I don't know uh, what category I think I fall into, but here's actually, here's how I decide that. Um, one second. The way I know what kind of bass player I am is like when I first pick up a bass, what do I do? You know, if I go, okay, you're a slapper. I get it. That's the first thing you do when you pick up a bass. For me, I guess I'm more of a funky, old school, soulful. I mean, like that's just, that's what I do. If I'm trying out a new instrument, that's the first thing that I do. Um, so I guess that's the type of sound that I make. What about you guys? What's the first thing you do when you pick up a bass? We got, uh, hey, Gustavo, good to have you. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Ataf from Simi Valley. Is that correct? You're the one from Simi? Uh, punk Hardcore. I play in a band called Total Massacre. Awesome. That is a fantastic name for a punk hardcore band. We got Russell says 90s alternative for gigs, uh, soul, funk, and blues, and general groove for development. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah, I used to play in a lot of punk in hardcore bands back, I don't know, high school, early college, um, just because that was the scene where I was growing up in Moore Park, which is not too far from Simi Valley. Uh, Fretless Six, hey, love fingerstyle funk, uh, what I play most when I pick up my bass. Yep. Uh, learning Slap, mostly playing CCM, that is contemporary Christian music, for those of you uh, who don't know what that means, and classic rock. Hey, Isaac, welcome. Glad to have you back, man. El Paso, Texas. Hope you're doing well, and God bless you. Likewise. Hey, I hope all of you guys are doing well. Um, if uh, the coronavirus is affecting you um, financially, it is for us. <laughs> we don't have any gigs anymore. No more tours. Um, yeah, things have come to a screeching halt here, um, especially in Las Vegas, where, where I am right now. Um, so I'm sure... The majority of you are kind of feeling the same thing if you're in countries that are quarantined or states that are locked down right now. So, uh, yes, likewise, I hope you guys are doing okay with everything that's going on. I have a question for you. Is everything all right? The sound of my voice okay? The sound of my bass, are we uh, you guys getting everything all right? And by the way, there's also a about a 10-second delay um, between what I'm saying and what you respond with. So if there's dead time like that, that's me waiting for you to reply because we have to go through time first. <laughs> Evan says, another day, another basis live stream. Yes, that's precisely what we're doing. Good afternoon, y'all. Yes, the sound and the bass are great. Fantastic. Steven or Stefan. No, that's probably Steven. Maybe it is Stefan. I don't know. <laughs> but it says gospel, uh, jazz, CCM, another church player, alternative and funk, love finger style and slap in, La in Fayetteville, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Fay Fayette. They have weird names over there. Not just weird names, but they pronounce them strange. Uh, I forget where we played. North Norfolk. It's pronounced N-O-R-F-O-L-K. But everyone around there called it Norfolk. Or no whatever it is, they just didn't say it the way that it was spelled. So we're gonna run, oh, we're playing at this place on in, in Norfolk, uh, North Carolina, and that's or Virginia, wherever it was. And that's obvious. Oh yeah, these guys aren't from around here. It's called Norfolk. What? <laughs> Where do you get that from? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, welcome Jamie Lewis support. And yeah, we got some new faces. And of course, we love rock and roll. So hey, let me talk about what we're doing here today. Um, this is a 
first impression live stream. And the reason I put that in air quotes is because technically I've used the Apollo twin before. First of all, thank you Universal Audio for sending this my way so that I can do this video and probably a lot of other videos with it too. Uh, but this is the thing that we're exploring today. It's called an Apollo twin. All right, now this is a piece of recording hardware. Uh, it's an audio interface. And I wish that I could hold the thing and show it to you or put it on the pedal board cam or something like that. However, here's the problem. This has to connect directly to my computer, which is about 15 feet that way. It's in another room, closed door. Um, the, the point is to keep the noise of the computer away from microphones. It's one of the reasons why uh, this room sounds so clean is because the, the, the noise is elsewhere. Um, so I can't give you a hands-on show it to you, but this is the picture. This is what it sounds like. Um, and pretty much, yeah, it's just a little tiny two-channel interface with a lot of amazing features on it. And again, that is made by Universal Audio. These guys make, uh, well, I mean, like the original recording hardware. One of the first mixing consoles, if not the first, was invented by Bill Putnam, the guy who started this company. The 1176 compressor you've probably heard of, that's made by these guys. The LA-2A, another iconic, I mean, I think since the 1940s, that's been like the... Um, uh, staple in broadcast radio and one of the most famous compressors of all time also made by teletronics which was purchased by universal audio so anyways these guys have been in the game for decades since the beginning of recording um and so the reason why i bring that up is because that's kind of what we're going to be using today again i've had an apollo twin before so i know the ecosystem i know how it works it's just this one's like their latest version of it the apollo twin x um, so this is going to be a bit of a uh, exploratory live stream. Um, I'm going to pull up. I've got a screen recording over here. Uh, so you can see we're going to have, I've got some playing tracks that I just pulled up. Uh, whoops, here we go. Uh, some playing tracks pulled up over here so you can hear it in the context of a mix. And then this over here is the console software. And that's the thing about the Apollo Twin is there, it's the reason why I can have it 20 feet in a di totally different room. Uh, is because it's all software driven. So anything I can do here with the computer using these plugins or changing volumes and all this stuff, I'm actually affecting the physical hardware unit as well. So that's something that's really, really neat about the Universal Audio ecosystem. So basically uh, what I'd like to do today is just kind of explore some different sounds using UAD plugins and just uh, playing it over here in these different audio examples. And of course, if you have any questions that any point in time, ask them. Uh, I'll come back over here to the chat stream uh, fairly often. And uh, yeah, let's just kind of explore this and see what kind of sounds it can make. That's the reason why I'm using a P bass. I wish it was in better tune. Actually, uh, <laughs> I just pulled this out of the case and the neck was crazy. So I grabbed uh, uh, um, Allen wrench and just kind of straightened out the neck a little bit. So the action is better, but I didn't have enough time to intonate it before <laughs> going live. Uh, but yeah, so we're using a P bass. That's a sound we're all familiar with and we should get some amazing tones today. Um, so are there any questions, anything off the top? Uh, let me know and I'll answer them. Uh, but otherwise we're just going to kind of dive into this. Are you guys ready? Ready to learn about the amazingness of the Apollo Twin. So check this out. I'm gonna bypass these plugins over here just so um, you can hear what my bass sounds like with no processing whatsoever, okay? So um, this right here is just bass totally dry, no effects. trying to play anything I can. So that's uh, totally dry, straight up just recording with no effects. Now, typically with the average audio interface, uh, this is how you would record. You record a completely blank slate. And then when you get inside your DAW, Pro Tools or you know whatever it is that you're using, from this point, what you'll do is you'll start adding plugins and effects. Here's what Universal Audio has. Using this Apollo Twin, or any of their interfaces, you can actually put the plugins on your bass before it goes to Pro Tools. And I know that sounds kind of impossible, but essentially you can track with 
digital plugins as if it was hardware. So right here, I've got a Neve 1073 plugin. That's the most iconic preamp of all time, especially for bass. Uh, and I'm running into an 1176. Whoops. Right, if I bypass these again, this is where we started. Now, I do apologize. Uh, the strings on this bass are also a little bit dead. So out of intonation is out of whack. And, you know, I don't have that zing that you would want to hear. But I can, you know, fix that with a little bit of EQ. You can see I'm pumping the top end. I'm doing a boost at 1.6. So we, we, we can correct a little bit of that sludginess. Uh, but so that's the awesome thing about the Apollo series of interfaces. And again, I've used them before. And that's the reason why I was able to show you all this really quickly is because you can actually put plugins in your signal chain before it hits Pro Tools or Studio One or GarageBand, whatever you're using. And the reason why that's so awesome is because it opens up an analog workflow for the digital realm. And that's amazing because these plugins sound incredible. And that's one thing we'll do today. I'm gonna show you what some of the different preamps sound like. We'll explore the amp sims which are amazing. Oh my God, the best amp simulator in simulator I've ever heard in my life are, uh, actually I can like show them to you really quickly. It's the, uh, hold on, the bass guitar. This one here, the Ampeg B15. That's an incredible plugin. And also the SVTR, uh, VR, which is like a vintage reissue of the, the classic SVT head. And there's a whole bunch of other guitar and bass simulators, amp uh, pedals and stuff. I don't have them all. You gotta buy them, so. We'll just have to use what, what I have. Uh, but this is fantastic stuff. So I'm just going to jump over to the chat stream, see if you guys have any questions. All right, here's, uh, sorry, AJ, I saw this, but um, I didn't uh, catch it earlier enough. You said normal versus VX so far. I don't really know what that means. Um, or if you're talking about the normal twin versus the X series, I think the only difference is the they upgraded the conversion. So when you have digital recording hardware, your signal starts out analog, goes into the thing, the, the, the interface, it converts your analog signal into zeros and ones. So that's called A to D conversion. And then it processes it with plugins and does whatever digital does. And then there's a D to A conversion, digital to analog, where it turns it back into sound that you can hear through headphones or speakers or whatever. So I know for sure with the Twin X or all of their X series, you answered it well. Yeah. So I, I know that they got an upgrade in conversion and that's something that happens every year. <laughs> Whenever someone releases a new interface, the conversion's getting better. The conversion gets better. It's kind of like the new iPhone. The camera gets better. The It's got more hard drive space or whatever. Um, and I think also uh, they're putting more DSP in the chips. That's another thing uh, is these plugins uh, run off of not your native hardware RAM, but actually DSP processing that's inside the unit itself. Um, so that's really cool uh, because you don't have to worry about latency. I don't hear any latency right now. It, it's instantaneous. And, and that's, again, with a DAW, you don't get that. There's going to be some form of latency, you know, milliseconds or tens of milliseconds, and that's terrible. So, yeah. Uh, fretless says, uh, fretless six, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Russell. What connections does it offer for the computer? Uh, this is currently going Thunderbolt 3 or USB-C um, is the, the connector. Um, I, I know they have Apollo Twins USB. I just don't know if they have the Twin X. If you go to uaudio.com, actually, hey, let's do this together. Yeah, Give me one second. Hold on. Where's the internet? Come here. Do I have? No, that's not what I want. Okay, now we have an internet browser. Let's see. Um, sorry, I've got like two different screens here. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where my mouse is. All right, so if we go to uaudio.com. Sorry, I'm away from the mic. Uh, audio interfaces. Yeah, you can see they've got a bunch of different ones. The Arrow, the Twin X, the Apollo 4X, X6, X8, X8P. Uh, this is the one we're looking at here or this is one we have today. And uh, cascade up to four using Thunderbolt. Okay, so this one happens to be Thunderbolt only. 
Uh, but I know that they have, uh, okay, let's see all interfaces. I know they have twins that are not. Where is, uh, probably here at the bottom. X twin. twin. Okay, I had, I think I had, no, I had this one down here. Yeah, so this one's USB. Um, this one is, oh, I can't read it. It doesn't really say. Yeah, so they do have USB. I don't think, oh, no, they still have Firewire. So if you're back in that decade, you can still use uh, your 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 FireWire cards. But anyways, yeah. So for the newest one, the the the, the Twin X, it is definitely uh, Thunderbolt three. Um, Fretless six says processing happening locally on the Twin or in the DAW. It's being done on the Twin. So uh, again, that's the cool thing about the UAD plugins. I turn them off. Right. This is before I'm doing any processing. And now I'm throwing in a Neve 1073 emulation. Incredible sounding plugin. And now I'm throwing in a little bit of compression. You can see the meters just dancing here between three and five dB. Okay, that time it went to seven, but yeah, the lower frequencies hit it harder. But for the most part, it's dancing right there. Um, and if you look over here in Studio One, this is my DAW. And all of the plugins that I normally have on are completely bypassed. There's only one that I have, which is just doing 4 dB of gain boost because the signal's a bit quiet at the moment. And uh, um, I just rather boost it digitally rather than uh, having it affect the, the signal chain. But that's the only thing that I'm doing. So everything else, yeah, you're hearing it from the twin not from the DAW. And again, that's what's cool is there's no latency and it's going to print that way. So actually there were a couple of years where this was my live touring setup. It was an Apollo twin and my laptop. And I would basically go in and using the console software, that's what you saw over there on the right hand side of the screen. I would just create bass tones and then, I mean, that's what I'm going to use in the studio. So why not play that live? Right? So anyways, um, yeah, the X does not have USB, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, I use an ancient Mac Pro 2007. Yeah, that's not going to do the job anymore. Sorry. <laughs> Mark says, Jamie, thanks for giving a place to come during the... Yeah, no, absolutely, man. This is kind of um, uh, the reason why I started posting more often and doing more live streams um, is, I mean, yeah, we're, we've all got some extra time right now. So why not get better at our instruments, learn some new things? And obviously, I mean, I'm learning things from you guys too. This isn't a one-sided... Uh, conversation you know um so yeah i'm having a blast doing all this stuff and and i'm glad that you guys are digging it and showing up so uh let's do this i'm gonna jump back over here sorry i'm gonna drink some tea first hold on out of my uh incredible xena warrior princess coffee mug this is the only well it's a coffee mug but i use it for tea <laughs> oh and if you guys haven't done so uh you saw that little thing over there but make sure you uh um, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification button. That'll notify you the next time I go live um, and, and do these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, let's just do some tone uh, shaping over here. So, like I said, we've got a Neve 1073 uh, preamp emulation, which this is the holy grail of, uh, of, of recording preamps especially when it comes to bass. The reason why I'm actually, I'm going to do a whole video series on different preamps and the flavors that they bring specifically geared towards bass guitar, but obviously this applies to any instrument and the Neve sound is known for this. It's got a smooth milky low end. Those are the words we would describe it and a sizzly top end. And that just sounds perfect for bass, right? That low milky, not muddy, I'm going to turn this compressor off and I just want you to uh, check this out. Okay. I'm going to by bypass the Neve preamp. I'm going to put it back on. You hear that fatness that that uh, low mid low end bump we got. I am doing some EQ, right? I am boosting 110, but that's not really the mm, frequencies anyways, but we're getting them just from hitting the preamp. And actually I can turn off the EQ so you can, hear the difference between uh, just dry preamp. It just goes, mm, saturates the low end. And obviously the EQ is adding a little bit of weight, uh, sorry, a little bit of volume also. 
because I'm using it to, to boost rather than cut. Uh, but anyway, so fantastic sounding preamp, fantastic compressor. <laughs> The reason why I love the 1176, it's really quick, and that's what we want for bass. Um, it, this, this is just one of the fastest compressors on the market. So uh, let's put this in context with, with a track. I've got like four of them over here. Uh, I don't really know what these sound like, so I'm going to press uh, play and see if I can find one that uh, kind of matches the tone that we have right now and see if it would be a good fit. All right, this one's a bit rock. I'm gonna save that for when I have a like an Ampeg SVT or something. Okay, all right, this one's like a soulful, old school sound, and that's what we're gonna go with. Now, the Neve 1073 came from a, a console, the Neve 80 series, I think, 1970s. If you guys have ever seen the documentary. It. Who it was the Dave Grohl documentary Sound City I think is what it's called. If you've ever seen that before, it's pretty much about this classic Neve console at this iconic recording studio in I think Van Nuys. And uh, yeah, it's just like hit record after hit record after hit record were recorded on this particular board because of the preamps that were on it. And it uh, actually they weren't 1073s. I think they were 1066s. Either way, it doesn't matter. Great sounding stuff. It, it, it just it doesn't get any better than this. And that technology came from the 1970s. And so this is kind of like a 60s, 70s soulful vibe. So this is gonna be perfect. Actually, the only thing I might change, I'm gonna turn off the 1176 and I'm gonna put on a different type of compressor, um, which is another holy grail. There's, there's two of them that I want you to remember. One is the 1176, which we're currently using. And the other one is the LA-2A. This guy. Now, this is a great compressor because there's only two knobs. Whoops, why do I have two of them? Let me turn that off. Oh, that's the 1176. <laughs> they look the same to me. All right, so this only has two knobs, in, uh, peak reduction and makeup gain. So this is a stupid easy compressor if you don't know how to use it. Basically, you just adjust this knob until you see the meter dancing. All right, let's give it a bit more. All right, that's too much, right? Well, I want to do about five to seven dB gain reduction with this track. I'm gonna give it a little bit more. That's too much, so split the difference. Now, the only other knob we have is makeup gain. And so when you compress, you're bringing the volume down and you need to boost up the volume at the end. So essentially, this is the one knob compressor and it's a great one knob compressor. And all I need to do now is just match the volume. That's no compression. Actually, they almost sound the same. Uh, if, if you're having a hard time hearing the difference, keep your eyes on the meters over here. Check this out. This is with the compressor. So it's peaking around minus six, but it's living around that negative 12, negative nine. I'm gonna pull it off. Pretty much doing the same. I'm gonna drive the peaks harder because we are getting in to dangerous territory. Tracking too hot. Yeah, beautiful. Such a, such a great compressor. Oh man. <laughs> okay, I'm loving that tone. All right, so let's track with this. Um, give me a second to learn the song. Anyone talking to me? Sound City, yep, that is the one. Henrik, good to have you, welcome. And Voodoo, I'm glad you enjoyed the last podcast with the Bass Wizard. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so this is like a Motown kind of Aretha Franklin vibe.
these plugins now so you can hear what it sounds like totally dry. And that's the cool thing is it doesn't sound bad. It's just very dry. There's that saturation. Me of Donald Duck done. idea when this is going to end. of fun that's a really cool groove i'm gonna have to use that one if you're wondering where these uh backing tracks are coming from i'm using them uh from a loop library called big fish audio i did a um, a live stream a couple of weeks ago with them uh, so if you want to check them out um do that uh but these all these will get used in future lessons here at the basis.net so eventually these will be backing tracks to something that i'm going to use this in a lesson at some point and you'll get to you know download it and play along uh let's check uh i'm sorry oh no we're caught up good um Voodoo Funkster says, uh, really enjoyed the latest podcast. Or yes, I did say latest. Uh, with the Bass Wizard. So actually, yeah, let's talk about that real quick. I have a weekly podcast that goes live each and every week called The Bassist Podcast. And the very last episode featured The Bass Wizard, Mr. Marcelo Feldman. I was in Los Angeles before the world ended <laughs> last month. And uh, yeah, we just sat down and chatted. Actually, this was a great conversation. He said something to me um, that really like changed the rest of my day during the conversation. Um, we were talking about, you know, growing a YouTube channel and, uh, you know, expanding our audience and, you know, just what it's like to be a modern musician navigating these digital waters. And, uh, I was mentioning how, you know, it's really, I, I have a hard time, uh, getting views on my videos and really, um, getting new subscribers. And, um, and he was like, oh man, growing your channel is the easiest thing in the world. I was like, what do you mean? I'm having a hard time with it. It's like, it's like, dude, anyone can grow a YouTube channel. Anyone can grow a Spotify or, or Instagram, whatever the thing is. He's like, it's really easy. What's hard to do is to grow a channel and also do the things that you want to do. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Like, I really like doing vlogs and performance videos and like the things that I really, really like to do, those don't get as much attention as the slap tutorials or the, you know, you'll never believe or the top 10, whatever. Like, I just, I, I don't like, I don't like that kind of stuff and I don't do it, but it really, really brings in the numbers. And so he was like, the, the thing to do is just grow your channel, doing the things that people want to see. And then once you've got a large enough audience, you can kind of change gears and um, start to, you know, do the things that you want to do and incorporate that into your audience. And then your channel will really start to grow. You've seen this with Adam Neely. You've seen it with a lot of other people. Um, where, uh, or I mean, think about like music, right? John Mayer's first album was like a pop 
alternative rock. I mean, it, it, I, in my opinion, not good. The Body is a Wonderland song, right? He did that, I think, to <laughs> do a major label release and, and get huge amount of exposure. And then his next record, Continuum, it has Gravity, Waiting on the World to Change, all these amazing songs. And that was the first time I was like, oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do the thing to get the people in the door and then you know, move on to what you want. I don't know. Anyways, that was something that I really, really got out of that. So um, yeah, anyways. And a couple other things that maybe I'll just take a quick second to mention is there's a video that went live a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you check it out because it shows you how to play this. <laughs> Yeah, really awesome video. So there's a link in the description. You can uh, check that out if you want to learn how to play it. Again, backing track included and tabs, uh, everything totally um, taken care of. And hey, there's another series I started here called Watch Me Practice. There's one episode of it, but essentially you get to just watch me practice. <laughs> I love that. That was a happy accident. I didn't realize what I was doing. I have like 50 of these on my computer because when I practice, I press record and I just go for my own, you know, I can go back and see what I suck at, what I need to work on because it's a warts and all kind of video. There's no fixing or adjusting at all. And so, um, I was just like, I don't know, maybe I'll just start releasing these. So if you like them, please do me a favor. Uh, let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll keep releasing them. I'm going to do another few for the next couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, if you guys like them, I'll, I'll keep posting them. And the only uh, one other thing I want to mention is there's a video that went live last week called How to Get Your Kids to Practice. So if you have children and you want them to get into music and they're stuck inside right now, they can't go do other things and you want something for them to do, um, I highly recommend you check out this video. How do I get my kids to practice? That's my name, uh, Lucy. Exhale. You have to push all the numbers whenever you see the number that girl steals my heart each and every time uh but anyways yeah so that's what's been going on lately here at thebasis.net and there's tons of new content coming out this week again the podcast yesterday i think i did another video i don't know i've, I've just been filming and recording non-stop so uh subscribe to the channel if you haven't and uh follow me on all the socials instagram uh twitter Facebook. I think it's all at Jamie Lewis. Oh no, it's written down here. Yeah. So you can see what's what. Uh, okay. Let's answer some more questions and then we'll do some more, uh, exploring with, with this Apollo twin. Um, sound city. Yeah. 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 Henrik says, uh, love that funky sound. Yeah. Can't beat the sound of a P bass with some UAD, uh, plugins, Neve 1073 preamp, the LA two way or the 1176. It's classic. It's iconic. Uh, Fretless Six says, uh, dang, I always dislike the way P sounds solo. Man, is it sit, sit in the track? Yeah, that's my feeling about the P bass as well. It's not anything to write home about. It's just, for me, it's like an average, like, oh, yeah. It's not, it's never going to sound bad, but it's never going to wow me. And that's kind of what's so cool about it is you can't go wrong with it, <laughs> you know, which when you're in the studio, uh, that helps out a ton. Um, Mark says, my SX P bass don't sound like that. Well, I've got some Aguilar uh, hot pickups. I think they're called the HP. I don't know. Um, but this is a bit of a, I think it's got like 10 dB hotter than like a normal passive bass. Um, and yeah, it's just, I just volume and tone knob are all the way up. It's a maple neck, so it's a bit brighter. Again, dead strings, but um, that also kind of helped for that last track. Uh, Mark says, Jamie, how come my P bass sounds like a bass string pulled over a wash bucket? Could be your um, pickups. Check out the Aguilar ones. I really like them. AJ, yeah, that is funny. Uh, Willie, hey, welcome, says, uh, you make that look too freaking easy. Thank you, Willie. Um, I don't know. I was looking for a way to respond to that to not sound condescending. It is easy. Um, you just, huh, what's the best way of explaining it? I think the, 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 the best thing you can do anytime you play is to get your mind out of the way, whether you're improvising, trying to execute, whatever it is. Um, if you're thinking about it, 
you're just not going to do as good of a job as if you just close your eyes and let whatever happen happen. And that's actually what I really like about that um, Watch Me Practice series is you can see that's exactly what I do. I'm going for something. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> you know, but just that freeness of like, you can do whatever you want. And honestly, that's like uh, hand a kid a paintbrush or a crayon and be like, draw whatever you feel like drawing. I mean, yeah, there are no rules. It, you, it's effortless, you know, and obviously the more you do it and the more refined it becomes, the more sophisticated your paintings or your, your music becomes. And it appears effortless, but it's always been effortless. It's always been easy. It's just you need to do it enough times to, to where that becomes natural and where you can execute that at a, at a, at a higher level as well. Uh, Isaac says, Big Fish Audio. Yes, those are the guys. Awesome. Have you washed that shirt yet? Yes, I have. Hey, speaking of this shirt, if you guys want to get one, uh, you can head over to shop.thebasis.net or click on the link in the bio. We've got a bunch of cool shirts there. Can't even see it. Get this out of here. Yeah, that's that's what it looks like right now. I, I know I've been wearing it a ton, but yes, I have been washing it. It is not uh, <laughs> the same exact one. That would be nasty. Um, oh, someone texted me a link. Oh, Ben texted me a link to watch Sound City if people are interested. YouTube won't let you post it? Oh. Okay, hold on. I will uh, copy and paste this somehow. I don't know if I can. Oh, here we go. Hold on. I'm going to type this in. If you guys don't... This microphone keeps moving. If you don't know the documentary that we were talking about... Uh, wait, where is my screen? Here's the URL so you can watch it. This. this is a great documentary http no not po sorry guys give me one second i'm going to type this in but i have to do it by hand the base e dot st oh i forgot the two slashes <sighs> hold on you know what i should have i should have some like jeopardy music <laughs> for every time i'm killing time like this sound city it looks like this is the url so if you click that um you should be able to watch uh, that awesome documentary called Sound City. Um, uh, I definitely spent too much time thinking walking. Okay, hold on, hold on. All right, Henrik, I'm con I'm not sure what you're saying. It says you, youing it like a walking, and I know you meant to say walking. I'm not exactly sure what um, what you're asking there. Uh, if you can rephrase that question for me, I'll I'll, I'll definitely get back to it. Um, AJ, on that note, how do you get over the red light, red light panic? Okay, what AJ is talking about is when you're about to record, you might be, you know, all relaxed and loose and everything's good, and then the red light comes on, and all of a sudden everything locks up, and you just you're not playing as well anymore. Um, and that happens all the time. I, I think there's there's two things that help me. Number one, if I can squeeze in a good workout or a good yoga session or just something. If I feel good, I'm gonna play well. If I feel bad, I'm not gonna I'm gonna play bad. <laughs> you know, the two are connected: your body, your music, your mind, your heart, your soul. It's all one thing. Um, at least I think it is. So uh, I would say that's the first thing: is do you feel good going into the session? And if you don't feel good, uh, do something. Do whatever it is that does make you feel good. Again, for me, it's exercise, eating healthy. Like if my body feels right, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill it. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, I think it's good just to remember that you like this part of playing music is playing with other people, performing it in front of people and recording it for people to listen to. So if you don't like any of those things and they make you nervous, scared to the point where you don't want to do them, I think you're in the wrong business, right? I mean, like it, imagine a, uh, a pool man, someone who, someone who services pools, swimming pools, but he doesn't like to swim. Doesn't like getting wet. <laughs> doesn't like uh, wearing shorts and sandals. Like if, if if the things of the gig are things you don't like, then I, I don't think pool man is the profession for you. Maybe you should try something where you get to stay inside all day. So I, I'm not saying if you get red light syndrome or what'd you call it, red light panic, that you need to stop doing music. It's not for you. I'm saying if you can't in your mind reframe it so that it's like, oh, these aspects, the nervousness, the um uh, the uncertainty, the anxiety, you have to enjoy that. You have to enjoy that. Like, oh yeah, this is part of it. And I actually do like it. I really do enjoy it, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's 
fill in the blank, whatever. You have to remind yourself that you like it. And if you can't do that, if you can't remind yourself, if you can't like that aspect of the process, um, then yeah, I think you're probably trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And it's not saying that you can't learn to enjoy those things because of course you can, you can overcome any fear. You know, like spiders, let a few of them walk around in you for a little bit. Eventually you'll realize like, ah, oh, they're not that bad. <laughs> I wouldn't, I still wouldn't do that. Uh, anyways, Henrik says walking like in jazz when you're playing that funk. Okay. So your question is, uh, like, do I walk? Was I adding in some walking lines? I don't know. Maybe I was. Um, it, are you asking how I did it or why I did it? Um, I understand the walking part. Uh, just tell me what your question is. Do I like to walk? How do I walk? <laughs> why did I walk in that last song if I did? Uh, let's head back over here while, while you're uh, clarifying that question. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be a pain. Uh, just trying to clarify. Let's come back over here and let's get a totally different tone. Um, I said uh, that, oh shoot, I'm on the wrong uh, screen. Okay. Um, I said that uh, the cool thing here is you can get drastically different tones. So I'm going to turn off this Neve preamp and I'm going to swap it out for, uh, let's go with an amplifier, the Ampeg SVT. All right. This is one of the holy, again, another holy grail of bass amps. I'm going to turn off all my compressors. Yeah, so compressors are off, and we're just hearing uh, the SVT sound. I know it's quiet, and don't worry, I'll gain it up afterwards. Here's the other cool thing about this software. Um, if you don't know where to start, we have all these cool presets. So this one's called 8x10 Funky Rock A. Sounds like they're all a bit soft. And this is the reason why I said before, the only plugin I'm using is this gain plugin. So I can add like 12 dB of volume. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, so let's come back over here and I'm just gonna scroll through these presets till I find something that, uh, that I kind of dig. That's a pretty good rock tone. That's a little sharper. I know you're going to get tired of hearing that over and over and over again. These are all kind of sounding the same. Let's go for uh, Broken Amp. <laughs> all right, that's what a blown speaker sounds like. Dark Lows. This is going to be a bit muddy. It's not what most people think of when they think of the Ampeg SVT sound. Fretless Lyrical. That sounds terrible, like I was playing a fretless. And you can see what's happening over here. Every time I go to a different preset, these knobs are switching around. Um, so if I was going to play this, I would actually, let's do this. Let's go to the uh, Metal Maiden. Now, I'm going to default this guy out. Actually, I really like where this started from. Yeah, that's the fullest sound of one I'm going to go with. Uh, so we have different inputs. These have, like on a regular SVT, different, um, I guess, volume. Uh, you know, one's for a quieter bass. Or no, sorry, this is channel one. One's uh, a normal signal, one's brighter. I'm looking right at it. It says bright. And uh, we're going with channel two in this case. We've also got an effects rack over here. Uh, whoops. Where is the... Oh, shoot. My mouse is freaking out. <laughs> Give me one second. Apparently, I did something my computer doesn't like. There we go. Um, I'm going to... We got a little bit of noise gate. Okay. So you guys can hear that. If you're listening to this on headphones or um, on some speakers, you can hear those hiss now. And now the hiss is gone. So as you drive the speaker, you know, you get you get more of that hiss. Now the hiss went away, and I'll turn the noise gate off completely. Yeah, not bad. Um, I'm going to change the... Uh, you, you can change the microphones. You can't get as 
intricate as some of the other plugins where you can like move the mic around and get different sounds, but they've already done it. So here's the sound of an eight by 10 with a dynamic seven. So that's an SM seven, the same mic I'm using here in conjunction with a ribbon. But without grabbing any of these knobs over here, I can get a totally different sound just by grabbing a different mic. Let's say I was going into an eight by 10 with a, uh, uh, I don't know, let's try this one, the 409. I don't know what mic that is. I like the other one better, but that's pretty cool. Dynamic just with 257s. One thing I really like to do is drive the input game with this plugin. So basically hit the preamp harder and then I'll back off the volume with this guy. Let's soak this guy. Let's play with a pick. Let's go back to that first, uh, oh geez, that first microphone. I really like the seven with the ribbon. absolute rubbish with a pick. Actually, you know what's funny is before this live stream, I was running around looking for guitar picks because I don't know, I don't, I don't have any. <laughs> I know I just moved here a, a couple of months ago, so some things are still in boxes. And I know I've got like 200 guitar picks lying around, but I just have no freaking idea where they are. This is my last guitar pick. So <laughs> I'm going to use it in this session because I spent like 10 minutes looking for it. Uh, we got a couple of the lines. Um, Henrik says, tabbings. I think just shorter sounds. Funky thing is faster mute. I'm sorry, Henrik. I really don't know what that means, but I know that English is not your first language, so don't feel bad. Um, but, uh, I'm not really sure how to, how to help you. Um, Isaac says, can you tell us and recommend how to start in the recording world without any knowledge? You know what? Yes, I absolutely can. Hold on just one second. I'm going to show you. If you guys don't know, this is my website. It's called the basis.net. Um, Oh, wait, sorry. You're not looking at it. All right. Now you will be. There we go. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, like I said, this is, this is my website. It's called the basis.net and, um, shoot this two computer monitor is, is freaking me out over here in videos and then go to extracurricular lessons. First of all, um, uh, this is the basis curriculum. So, Basically, anyone who subscribes as a member here, uh, you go through these eight courses. And basically, you learn the basics. I teach you how to practice. I show you all of your scales and arpeggios and rhythm. I show you how to groove. And then there's music theory, ear training, and an entire reading cu curriculum. So once you complete that, you come over here to the extracurricular lessons. And here under gear, tech, and tone, I've got a series called The Bassist's Guide to Recording. So what I'm going to do is copy this and I'm going to paste it over here. So, uh, AJ, I'm sorry, I forgot who asked that Isaac. I think it was you. Um, but if you, uh, if you click on that link that I just dropped in the chat stream, um, it starts over here in lesson one. I know it goes from shoot. I'm on the wrong screen again. <laughs> I'm learning guys. Forgive me. Uh, you know, it goes from lesson number one, two, three, four, five, six, 12. I know I, I've got a lot of episodes to fill in and this is something that I'm going to be doing more in the next couple of weeks, I've got a few videos that need to come out first, and then I'm going to jump back into doing these recording tutorials. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is starting from square one. What kind of gear do I need to get? Step two, how to set up your gear. Three, what the hell is a DAW? D -A -W. So all of that is, um, you know, taken care of at thebasis.net. Um, and, th and that's totally free also, by the way. Um, so you don't have to pay for that series that I just uh, uh, dropped that link. Um, totally free. Sorry, um, Nuclear says, how's the slap sound? You know, on an SVT, I, I would not. When it comes to slapping, I prefer the direct tone uh, as opposed to the, um, you know, uh, miking up an amp. I just think it sounds better. Um, and so, yeah, SVT, not really known for it. Ah. I'm also not much of a slapper. Um, so decent and also P bass, not my go-to for, for slap tone. Ah, yeah, pretty 
good. Not bad, but again, not my go-to for slap. It would be a J bass and then just totally, um, whatchamacallit, uh, to just go DI, no amp. Um, AJ, they do have room mix. It's soft tube uh, amp room. Yeah, yeah. Soft tube is the company that uh, license or that makes this plug in, and Universal Audio licenses it. Um, but yeah, there there is a room mic, I think, as well, uh, somewhere in here. But anyways, yeah, I'm really digging this sound. <laughs> My strings are a bit dead, so I'm going to hit the treble a bit harder. We're on channel two. Because I do want more of that pick coming through. Let's crank that sucker. And now I'm going to level it out with some rock compression. We're going to use the uh, 1176 over here. Now we really hear the gain, right? Because we're cranking it. So I'm just going to balance. I'm digging it. Let's roll with it. Um, I know that one of these two is a pretty good track for this. Hold on. Let me, let me listen to this one. No, I think it was this one. Okay, yeah, that's what we're gonna go with. I'm just gonna back this volume off a little bit. You know what? I'm gonna put two compressors on there. God, I'm loving that. That sounds so good. Uh, but but I am gonna back off this gain plugin because we're getting too much now. And just to give you an idea, right of where we started out i'm going to uh bypass hold on is this the button for bypass i'm not going to experiment because i might break it <laughs> so here's where we started yeah that's off that's off i'm sure there's an easier way to do this um but i've just got to go old school for now so here's the tone we started with completely dry <laughs> Then we added in the amplifier. Adds in a little bit of harmonic distortion, some more mids. Uh, then we hit this really fast compressor for that in-your-face rock bass tone. And I'm gonna adjust the attack to let a little bit more of those peaks through. And then I'm just going to squash it a little bit more with some uh, tube compression. Just kind of bring it a little bit more up in your face. God, that sounds so good. <laughs> okay. Oh, shoot. Wait, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to leave this where it was. All right. Let's try playing through one of these tracks. I'm going to bring all these down here just so you can see what they're doing if you feel like it while I play. But uh, let's go ahead and, and jam through this track. All right, let me see how the song goes. We got an A chord, going to a D, going to a G, back to a D. That is 
such a good rock tone. Okay, I'll try to play something more like a bass line. That is an amazing, amazing rock tone. You can see I dialed it in uh, really, really quickly. I started with the preset, adjusted the top end a little bit, and then just squashed those dynamics, uh, stacking two different compressors. And uh, man, that's that's a great, great sounding rock tone. So again, that's the cool thing about the Apollo also is you can get into really, really good sounding tones really fast and then print them to Pro Tools exactly that way. So saves a lot of time. Uh, okay, hold on. Nuclear Error says, it's okay. How about chords? Oh, playing chords. Um, with this particular sound, I probably wouldn't use it, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll explore that in one of the, one of the other sounds. Um, Henrik says, when you move around in the funky thing, uh, do a move like you move in walking like jazz, just shorter note in funky. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I, I, I think I'm understanding what you're saying, and now I've got... I'm out of tune. I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I still don't really see what the exact question is, but yeah, if you're doing walking lines and you're playing funk music, yeah, of course, shorten them up because that's kind of what you want to do uh, in funk music. I actually, I just finished filming a series, finished filming a series, say that 10 times fast, uh, called Funk Vocabulary, Essential Funk Vocabulary. Um, it'll be available at thebasis.net, and I talk about all of that kind of stuff. So you can check that out in a couple of weeks when it's ready. Um, Nuclear says, sounds just like a U2 bass tone. Yeah, <laughs> it's freaking awesome. Uh, actually, I don't know what kind of bass he uses, uh, but you can't go wrong with a P bass and, and an Ampeg amp. It's impossible. <laughs> they just sound so good. Uh, okay, I got one more thing here. Uh, let's try. Oh, actually, I got two songs. We already did that one. Um, you know what? Hold on. What we haven't done yet. Okay, we need to play this song. Uh, this is actually a song. Yes, I know what that one is. Okay, so this is a song from an album that I did some years ago uh, with a band called the Dread Pirate Roberts. I'm going to remove these plugins. We're going to start fresh. I'm going to use a different amp because um, this one's a bit more blues trio sounding. And I think that this B15 over here is really going to do the job. So let me uh, test. Let me go through some pre presets and, and test the volume and make sure we're all good. But this is going to be cool. If you don't know, the Ampeg B15 is like the quintessential studio bass amp of all time. Every recording studio has one of these. And almost every time you're going to plug into it, even if you bring your own. <laughs> Actually, I know for sure I like this 1966 channel. Or sorry, I think it's this one. Okay, I'm going to start there. Uh, we're going into this channel, the 1966. Uh, yeah, there we go. I'm going to turn the top end down a little bit, up the bass. And same thing as before. You know, I've got different microphone uh, combinations that I can try out. Um, 
there's one in here that I like. I just can't remember what it is. I definitely don't want to be using a 410. I want to be going through one of the 15s. Uh, and it looks like they've got some with EQ. This is a, a an AKG D20 microphone. I'm going to do the same thing as before with that power soak button. Where the heck is that? Hold on. Uh, oh, input gain. Right. Here we go. And we're going to drive this sucker and then pull back the output. Yeah, that might be a little bit too hard. I don't want to lose my transients. Always make sure you get it right. Okay, so let's go with that. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that uh, LA two way again. I'm going old school here because that's the sound that I'm going for. Let's drive it just a little bit. Tame out some of those peaks. Gain it up. Too much gain. Hold on. Oh, this is going to be cool. This is going to be a great tone. I'm going to bring some of that top end back because I'm missing it now. I know I dialed it out. Bring it back. Okay, I'm going to tune this guy up because I know I need to go down a, a half step. And that's perfectly fine because I wasn't in tune anyways. <laughs> uh, before I play this next one, uh, we'll hear this in, in context. Again, the point of this is not... Sorry, I forgot what, what note I was tuning. Uh, the point of this is not to get like the best sounding bass tone on its own, but always in context. So you might be listening to that last thing I was just doing uh, on the B15 with the LA2 in. It's like, ah, it doesn't, I mean, it's not really working for me. Uh, it doesn't sound good on its own. Before you make your decision, listen to it in the context of a mix, right? Always listen to it with the rest of the band playing along because there's things you might hear that are bothering you that all of a sudden don't bother you anymore when you have drums and guitar and all those other things. And there also might be things that you're missing until you hear the way that it interacts with everyone else. So always keep that in mind. Uh, let me see.
Damn it. Hey, you got to, got to, got to, got to give it all away. Hey, hey, come on, come on, come on, come on, and give it all away. The way you walk, you know I like your style. You know I want to make your mind all mine. Now let's get out of here, let's do this right. My gosh, I wish that these plugins were around back when we covered <laughs> covered back when we recorded that album because that uh, th- that is um, that's for the best tone blues rock trio, just that old school 1960s dirty rock tone. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Uh, not the playing, the playing was pretty subpar, but the tone, I'm really really impressed. Uh, Mark says sounds like Grand Funk Railroad. Awesome, thank you. We were shooting for Hendrix, but I'll take that as well. <laughs> Isaac, man, great sound. Thank you, dude. Mark. Um, so anyways, that's kind of uh, pretty much all we have with this guy. Um, it's just an audio interface. It's just recording my bass. But again, the cool thing that the Apollo ecosystem allows you to do is to actually record with these plugins um, and to hear them in real time with no latency. All the DSP is being done on the unit. And so you'll probably notice that they're a little bit expensive uh, if you go look at the website, um, however much they're charging on this, uh, it's more than you would pay for a two-channel inter- interface um, from any other manufacturer. But what you're not going to get with them is the DSP processing, the zero latency, this console software, the ability to track the plugins on the way in, and then also the plugins themselves. Um, I don't know how many it comes with, but you 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 can you know obviously buy third-party plugins and all that, which you won't get with uh, some of the other ones. So um, hey, let's do this, man. Uh, let's answer some last minute questions because it's about actually i'm not even looking what time is it yeah it's about 12 o'clock we've been going for about an hour so if there's anything else you guys want to do that doesn't necessarily pertain to this uh to the twin or to the recording stuff but um i'll chill around for as long as you guys want to hang so any other questions you have um anything at all let me know and i'll get well i mean we'll we'll keep going i'll stick around as long as you guys want to um so i'm going to take a five second break drink some tea and give you a second to write something. You see how I'm trying to kill time? This is the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> that's that's how it works because of the latency. So give me one second. Okay, Isaac says, are all of the plugins that I'm using free? No, they are not. Universal Audio plugins cost money and they are expensive. However, here's what you do. You buy them when they go on sale. Every month they do some sort of, and, and I'm this, I'm not, this isn't cheating. This is what people do, right? Every month at the, the first week or the last week or something like that, they'll have a special buy one, get one free, or everything's 50% off or buy the, these five plugins and save 70%, something like that. They always have some sort of deal going. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's what I would recommend. I'm not even wearing shoes. Look at that. Those are my bare feet. This is how imp- impromptu, no, improper informal <laughs> this is the most informal thing you're gonna find uh, on the internet uh but yeah so you have to buy the plugins but you can always get them on sale if you need it today you're gonna pay you know but if you can wait and just check in every month every couple of weeks whatever it is you can get slamming deals and i'm not kidding they are the best sounding plugins hands down for an for analog emulation you know if you look at waves slay or like any other any, any other companies that make emulations of the 1176 or this or that nothing comes closer than UAD. In fact, um, that's what got me into them because I had all that. I had Neve 1073s. I had API 312s and 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 uh, the uh, SSL G-series compressor, um, 1176, LA2. I, ha- I owned those things. Each one of those units costs like $5,000 for just one of them, right? And the cool thing here is you can, you know, I, I this one Neve preamp right over here, Oh, shit. I'm on the screen again. Damn it. Right? If I throw up uh, this guy right here, this one Neve 1073 is three to $5,000, just depending on whether it's vintage or new 
whatever, right? For one of them. So if you want to record your bass and a vocal, that's six thousand uh, dollars, ten thousand dollars, <laughs> right? Between six and ten grand. Whereas this, it's an emulation. It's the best one on the market. And look, I could have one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. I can put this plugin in as many places as I want, or as much as your DSP processing can handle. So that's the cool thing about the uh, the UA gear, is it sounds so damn close to the emulations, and a fraction of the price. So however much the plugins do cost, totally worth it. Uh, but anyways, um, AJ said solo mobile. Ah, oh, shoot. I lost it. <laughs> AJ, give me a second. I'm going to check on your, whatever your question was. Um, solo mobile or hybrid? Solo mobile. AJ, I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean. If you can elaborate on that question, I'll get back to you. Bass Players Anonymous says uh, they are much cheaper than buying the hardware. Yes. Barefoot Charlie, absolutely. Mark says, Jamie, I've been having a problem rotating my middle finger. Rotating? Are you talking about your right hand or your left hand? Rotating my middle finger with my index finger. It's like out of sync. Any solutions? Mark, I'm not really sure what you're saying, but that's okay. Here's what I want you to do. Film a video of yourself. It's okay. Do it on your phone. It uh, doesn't have to be good quality or anything. Just make sure I can see it and, and hear it. And then email it to me. My email is jamie at thebassist.net. I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you all my email address. It's like everywhere, so it's not a big deal. Send me all of your uh, inappropriate pictures. <laughs> but no, so so Mark, film yourself, send it to me. And uh, the next time I go live uh, with a practice session, which I think I'll be doing on Sunday, um, I'll, I'll, I'll address that. I'll, I'll help you out um, and I'll play that video clip and I'll be able to use it. So uh, yeah, just take a video of yourself on your phone. And this goes for anyone else. If, if there's anything you're struggling with, email me a clip, Dropbox a link, YouTube, you know, whatever. Um, actually, no, I, sorry. Don't send me a link to watch it. Send me a link to download the file because I want to be able to, then I can put it on the screen and all of us can uh, watch it together. Um, Fretless6 says, probably a topic for another time, hmm. uh, but I'd love to hear your musical journey from early years on piano to teaching to pro MD touring session guy. Sure. Um, How can I do the quick version of that? All right. So I explained this a little bit in that video, how to get your kids to practice, because that's part of my testimony of like the reason why this method works is because I've been doing it for 30 years. Um, I started playing piano at the age of three. I come from a musical family. My mother, my brother, my father, all my aunts, all my uncles, all my cousins, all of them, not just musicians, but professional musicians. So that's the home I grew up in. I started playing piano at the age of three, bass at the age of seven, drums at the age of six. And uh, I fell in love with the bass guitar probably around 10 or 11. And I haven't grown in my piano chops or drum chops since high school, probably. Uh, and that's when the bass guitar became like my main instrument. And um, so after years of that, I go to college. I graduate at the age of 19 or 20. I dropped out of high school. I didn't finish high school. So 16 years old, I started college. I dropped out of high school, started college, and formed my first corporation, the Lewis Music Academy, which is still standing today. Largest music school in Ventura County. We have about 550 students. Um, so I was doing all of that at the same time, going to double bass, or getting a degree in double bass. I finally graduate, and I have no work, no gig, no nothing. And so um, in my mind, I was going to be either a classical philharmonic musician or like a fusioned out session guy. I wanted to be Yannick Wasdala, Hadrian Ferro, and all these other guys. But my career just took me to a place of playing a four-string P-bass on country, rock, pop, church music. You know, that's that's where I ended up. Um, it's just like an average, uh, not average. Um, that's not the word I'm trying to say, but just like a meat and potatoes bass player. You know, that's, that's where my career took me. Um, and because of the amount of skill and time that I put in studying in college, studying jazz, fusion, classical especially, um, I just had skills that the other bass players didn't have. Not that you need to be the greatest bass player in the world to be an MD or a touring guy or whatever, but um, the more other skills you have, the more that kind of... Uh, if all I had to do was play bass, but I can also play bass and do this and do this and do this and do this, well, that guy's going to get the job <laughs> over the person who could just play the instrument well or decently well. You know what I'm saying? So I was overqualified for pretty much everything I ever went for, 
And that helped me advance. In other words, if I got the gig for playing the bass, the second time you called me, I was your bass player and I was your music director. The third time you called me, I was your bass player and your music director and your tour manager. <laughs> and like things just kept getting added to the list because the bass playing was so easy. Not, not saying that like I'm so good, it's easy. It's just the music is easy. Four chord rock music, pop music, you know, like sure, yeah. Anyone can really do that. But can you do that and, you know, handle all these other things? So really for me, it just kind of organically um, kept turning into something else and something else because in my youth, 13 years ago, I spent a lot of time putting in hours that uh, I never used. You know what I mean? I never became Victor Wooten. I never became the next Jocko. <laughs> you know, like those things didn't happen like when I was 15 years old and I was like, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, I think that overqualification definitely helped out. Um, and it also, I mean, me and Marcelo, uh, Bass Wizard, we talked about this on the podcast, but um, when you have a higher skill level than you need, it makes it really easy to do the job. So like we were talking about how in cover bands, I would have to learn 40 new songs in a day, right? And you don't have enough time to listen to each one, play along with it three or four times, and then go to the next song. I mean, there's not enough hours to do that before tomorrow, before the gig. So I learned how to learn songs in one listen or not even listening all the way through, just kind of jumping through and go, oh, there's a verse, there's a chorus, it's one, four, five, okay, pretty much this and that. Uh, this song is very similar to that one. Don't even need to listen to it. Move on to the next. Like it, it taught me how to learn music to the point now where when I go to, <laughs> if, if you hire me to play a show, depending on how difficult the music is, I charge the same for rehearsals as I do for the gig. So I don't ever do rehearsals. I, the first time I play your song is usually on sound at, at sound check on stage before we're going to go play the song. And usually that's also my first time playing it too. I haven't even listened to it until I'm driving in my car, on my way to your gig. And that I'm not bragging. I'm not saying that I don't care that, that, that like, um, what am I trying to say? I'm not trying to say that like learning your music is low priority. It's just, I can learn it so fast. I, I really can. I can get it done in about 30 minutes on my way to your gig. I don't even need to play it. I'll just walk up on stage and it'll sound the same as if I spent, you know, four hours rehearsing with you guys and it saves you money because you didn't have to pay me for it. You, you know what I mean? And, and those skills I learned from all of the hours that I put in when I was younger, developing my ear, training my um, my ear, my knowledge of music theory and all that stuff. So it makes it so I can uh, do the things I do today very quickly. Um, so I don't, I don't, that turned into a completely different side tangent. I apologize. But yeah, anyways, yeah, that's, that's my story. Isaac says, uh, great and thanks for the tips. My pleasure as always um, to tips two week and and get a great deal to buy those plugins yes you're absolutely welcome will you mention how to use these plugins in a live setting yeah yeah exactly what you just saw me do it's the same thing um, the difference is instead of here's what you would do um, instead of running into pro tools or something hold on okay so here i am in the the console software uh, give me just one second. I've got to get to my screen. Okay. Uh, I have this routed. Okay. So basically what I'm doing is instead of sending this to my outputs one and two, which go to my main speakers, all you would need to do, I'm going to come over here to the sends and you can see how on line out number three and four, I'm sending the bass signal and I'm also doing it mono. So basically from this output, instead of routing it to my main speakers, I just route it to an individual output. Most interfaces have at least four. Some have 16. I mean, it just depends on whatever. You assign the bass to an output, and now the bass is coming out of that channel. Run that to front of house or your amplifier, um, you know, recording console, whatever you're using. And now this is just a DI, essentially. So your preamp, everything is being done here. And then your direct out is just being sent through a separate output. And if I'm losing you on any of that kind of talk, don't worry. That's what the basis guide to recording series is for. Um, so you can check all that out there. Um, Henrik says, I can see now uh, that that is all about you use different amps and those music and set the sound better. Yeah, pretty much. We're just creating different tones. And this is something that recording engineers do when they're uh, when you come into the studio and I don't think you need to know everything there is about engineering to, to do this, um, but it helps. Because think of it this way. The engineer 
has two jobs. One is to take what you're giving him and, and, and work with it. And then also to make sure that it blends with everything else that's happening in the ensemble. So you might send him a bass tone that's killer, but against the kick drum, not going to happen. There's too much low end in both. We can't give it to each of you guys. So with your sound, I'm going to take out 30 and give it to him, give it to the kick drum, but I'm going to take out 80 and give it to you. That way, you know, you still get some of your oomph and so does he, but we're not it get, it, turning it into a really muddy sound. So that, that's what an engineer is doing. Taking your sound, working with it, and then make sure it blends with everyone else. If you can make it so that he doesn't need to do step two, he's going to like you. Or she, obviously. So what I'm saying is if you send him a tone that's already sculpted to the way that things are sounding in the room, and it's actually the dynamics are pretty good. We're already doing some peak reduction. Like, actually, this bass tone sounds great. Let's just start recording now. <laughs> you just saved him 20, 30 minutes or however long he was going to spend dialing in your tone. So that's why I think it's a good idea to know some of this stuff because you can put that into practice and get the call next time. Because if, if, if I knew that I could call in a drummer who's going to save me an hour, I'm going I'm to call that drummer, <laughs> right? Because time is money. That's how it works in the studio. Um, AJ says, I'm looking for an interface that works. On mobile, oh, I see, and computer, because uh, I need to switch from my setup. Um, yeah, the Apollo Twin definitely will not work on the phone. I would highly recommend against doing that for no other reason than uh, I, I couldn't imagine uh, the phone being able to keep up. Too small, uh, processor's not quick enough, not enough RAM. It's just you're not going to be able to do as much with it as you could on a computer. So what I would recommend doing is, is have like a separate mobile interface that's specifically for Instagram streaming or uh, uh, recording a concert footage or something like that. Uh, it's not going to be good studio quality, awesome stuff, but it's just like, oh, it's my phone. It's my mobile rig. And then you export that as WAV files and with your computer, you do the real editing, the real processing. But your phone, I just, I don't know. I mean, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's amazing technology now, uh, but I would just assume the phone is a fraction of as good and powerful as what a computer can do. So there, as far as I know, there are no high level interfaces that do both. It would either be one or the other. And if you're looking for something for the phone, I know iRig, uh, uh, I R I G it's made by IK media. Uh, that's a pretty common one. Um, and then yeah, for your computer, the UA stuff is top notch. And that's another thing too. This might just be out of anyone's price range here because it's, a, it, it's pretty heavy duty. It might not you might not need most of the features that it has, uh, but I'm just saying for, for for what it costs and for how good it sounds, whew, nothing compares to the to the Apollo the the UA stuff. Um, Fretless Six says, "Ha, the kids practicing video is what made me ask." There you go. Yep, yep, that, that was the one. Uh, Willie says, uh, "That's why you make it look so easy." Well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for a very very long time, so uh, th that's. Something I think is very, very important when you get started on the instrument. A lot of people wait too long to get into a performing scenario or where they're playing along with other musicians. Nah, you should do that before your first lesson. You should just I mean, start there, you know, pick up the bass, start playing with other people. Even if you don't sound good, it doesn't matter. The more you do it, the more you interact with other players, the more you're sharpening your musicianship, musicianship skills. God, I can't talk today. And those are the ones that are important, not just the technical playing stuff, but understanding music and how to gel and how to sculpt tone and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, I would be doing that even if uh, this was my first day. You know, if I was just picking up the bass guitar today, the more you play it and the more you interact with other people, just you're going to be exponentially getting better instead of just sitting in your practice room working on scales. And, and that stuff's important too. But hit the ground running, playing some music with some other people. That is really big. Uh, AJ says, I was thinking the jam or duet. I don't know what the jam is. Duet is made by Apogee, another great company. Uh, I've been to Apogee Studios a few times. That's where we actually recorded Kellyanne Keogh's, uh The Real Thing EP, Well-Behaved Women, Memphis. Those songs were recorded at Apogee Studios with Apogee Equipment. So, yeah, they're another top-tier company. Going to be expensive, Again, the only thing that the Duet doesn't have that the, the UAD stuff does is, again, those universal audio plugins and the DSP processing. Near zero, zero latency and um, just great sounding stuff. So 
Anyways, guys, thanks so much for uh, tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to doing this again. Probably, uh, let's see, when's the next time I'm going to go live? I think either this coming Friday or Sunday. It just depends on what kind of a week I have. Um, but I got some videos coming out tomorrow. I'm going to release another practice, watch me practice video um, from, I don't know, some other session that I've had recently. And uh, something else is coming out too. Oh, I'm working on another episode of The Money Notes. That's that series where I break down baselines and, and teach you how to basically create your own baselines off of the stuff that we learn from them. So if you have any requests for anything that you'd like to see at the YouTube channel or at thebasis.net for the money notes or any of that kind of stuff, uh, please let me know because um, I will make those videos for you. A couple of last questions. AJ, or sorry, Isaac says, do you recommend the Apollo Twin X or can I use another interface? Um, you can use any interface to record. The Apollo Twin X is just like the Mercedes Bentley, like of that price range, under $1,000. Yeah, it doesn't get any better quality-wise than the Apollo Twin. But, I mean, that's not to say you can't use anything by Behringer or Personas or Focusrite or anything that's in your price range. It's just you don't get those features and the quality is not the same. But, I mean, you can record anything with anything these days. That's the brilliance of digital recording. Anyways, guys, thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming and hanging out today. If you like what I'm doing, please do me a favor, subscribe to the channel just by clicking on that button right over there. And if you really like what I do, come hang out with me at thebasis.net by clicking on this guy down here. And remember, new episodes of The Basis Podcast go live each and every week. And until next time, I'll see you guys again here at thebasis.net. So stay safe, stay well, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.